coast and coast. Don't read the comments. It's good if you're one and done, but if you're trying right. to get that customer back. Yeah. You know you gotta I mean? remember the customer's always right. I gotta please the customer. Like all the customers in your comments, bro. Yeah, there's some customers <laughs> in my comments that I just don't think are all that right. That are always. But right. You didn't tip me. Oh shit. Okay. Oh what? <laughs> Overloaded. I remember, mentally. I remember my first podcast. You would think. We gotta get the pronghorn grilling. Yeah, it's in the freezer. Chilling. I got some. Uh, I wish now I had uh, saved more of it for steaks because it's really good, but I wasn't convinced that it was. Spoiler alert! That good. It's really good. It's stupid good. That's the first time I've eaten antelope as just antelope. Like slice it up, cook it, steak. Wow! Can you compare it to anything? No. That, that was the. I think that was the best grilled piece of meat I've ever had. No, it's terrible. Don't go antelope hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. It tastes like sewer rat. You never want it. Mm. As I'm wearing the antelope shirt, I didn't even think about that today. And how quickly did you get the the hide off of it? Uh, let's see. From the time I shot him till the time he was in the back of the expedition was maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, and then it was a oh, 15 minute, 20 minute drive back to where the truck was. Load the expedition on the trailer. Drove that back to town, another half hour, 45 minutes, and then hanging up and cape off. So another 15 on that. So it was less than two hours-ish from the time I shot it till the time there was what no was hide the temp, on it. temp of that day? You remember? It was cool. It was cool. I mean, it like... Which is rare when I was gutting, when I, no, yeah. yeah. When I was gutting him, I was getting rained on. Like a, ra a rainstorm had blown in, and it was probably like 70 and rainy. Did you run into uh, any snakes? Um, no, I never saw a snake the whole time. And how far was that shot again? Farther than you'd shoot. <laughs> the long bomb of destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Were you playing the wind in that shot? Long or? enough. There was no wind. Just it was hold, calm as could dead be. On. Yeah, it was more like it was kind of meant to be. Yeah, wasn't compensating for wind or anything because there just wasn't any. And his body position and everything about it was really good. So, and I had a pin for that, so it's all That's good. Rad. I mean, oh God, people would think you're so rad if they knew how far it was. Yeah, that 80 yard shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you can throw some more on there, boss. Yeah. I think, I th I think you're good. Yeah. Yeah, I left you a little pile there of goodies. Well, that's good to know. One of these days, I'll. Become an expert fire starter. Ooh, getting warm. There. Feeling warm? <laughs> and then that closes it, huh? Yeah, if you push down on it hard, it'll seal it real tight, but I would uh, just make sure it keeps, it'll look like it'll go, but make sure it, it uh, keeps rolling because we, uh, it needs that little bit of air pull from the open door at first oh, yeah. to get it going. Oh, yeah. Get the stuff good and hot, and then it'll just keep rolling on its own. You can shut it. And, oh, you're going to want to take the fan down. You don't like that thing. Apparently, it makes noise or something. What do they call this thing? Uh, eco fan. Eco fan. Yeah, my dad found them like 15 years ago, and it's just the heat from the fire makes the fan blades move. I was expecting And it blows the, the heater on the room. I was but, expecting a much fancier name than that. It's right on top, man. You literally put a snake at a bitch. It was in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we need to dive right into the archery rabbit hole today. Okay. No, no playing around the edges. You know what I mean. Which hole you want to dive into? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Are we diving into a hunting hole or a target yeah. hole or? Yeah, got all sorts of uh, uh, assembly hole. What are we doing? We got all sorts of controversy on the internet on the interwebs from the Mohawk guy shooting oh, light yeah. arrows through gallons and 
Yeah, they uh, I, uh give an unfair bow review. I faked it. Yeah, faked it. Faked it all. <laughs> That's so funny in some of that stuff. Some of the comments in there is like none of that. Your your video about that arrow weight that was not my idea at all, Mm-mm. and I didn't set up the parameters for it. You made the parameters Mm-mm. for it. I yeah. just gave you equipment that would work for the parameters that you were trying to to yeah. do. You facilitated. You dialed it in. Yeah, I just said, well, here's how you do. It. Here's how you test it right, and here's what you need to use to test it right. Outside of that, it's your monkey. I'm just holding the tail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, it sets up for a good round two. We'll definitely do round two. Yeah, what do you think we need to do to that, really? Like, is it is it realistic and or feasible to expect to effectively do that at, like, 40 yards or something like that? Because, I mean, you can be off by two inches on your impact, and the arrow's not going to line up with the jugs. So, I mean, maybe we can get a Crystal Geyser sponsorship for, like, a 1,000 jugs of water. So if we got to redo it, like, 10 times, we can. You know, it's... I feel relatively confident in being able to, you know, put it in probably a three inch circle at that distance every time or two inch circle. But if you're off by more than in probably an inch on the first spot, you're probably going to miss directionally by the 10th jug. It's, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I also bet at that distance, you're not going through eight anymore. There's some logistics involved that I think a lot of, a lot of people don't give credit to. Sure. Yeah. Well, why, why don't you test it at 100 yards, Tim? Yeah. Like, come on. How are you going to effectively I was make jo- sure I was joking target? with somebody, like, why don't you do a 50 or 60? I was like, because the 800 grand arrow would arc into the table. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you got a good I mean, point. I got to tip the table at an <laughs> angle so that because uh, that arrow's coming said, downhill yeah. so much at that point. Yeah. I'm going to slam the table. <laughs> yeah. But we learned some stuff. You know, there's good, good revisions for round two. And it'll be interesting. I mean, see how much the downrange energy does change things. I was actually surprised at... How many people were like, water's not a good medium. Um, a fluid-filled cavity is, what well, mostly water. It's it's mostly liquid and soft tissue. I mean, yeah. I, I get it. It's not a rib cage. Hide on or, both sides. And, and hide, but we're taking that out of the equation as far yeah. as, you know, what which one really penetrates more. And getting through the hide has is 95% the broadhead, not the physical weight of anything. Mm-hmm. You know, so what are you proving there? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. People people want to argue and complain. You know, it's the uh, it's the religious zealot where <laughs> your your documentation defaults their religion. Kind of married to your ideas, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like going into that. Well, I mean, I mean, what if what if it was way different? Would your ideas have changed? Yeah, probably. I mean, no different than yeah. when we were talking about it and we're walking back in that, and you're going. How wide arrow are you using? And I'm like, well, I'm not. I'm not convinced what I'm using is right, mm-hmm. and I believe that. I believe that my you know ultralight setup, even though I'm shooting a lot of weight and a lot of length, might not be right. So I'm testing it, and I'm putting it to real world application to prove whether or not it's right or wrong. Not just because it's what I believe and I know to be right 100. percent It's what I believe and I know to be most effective over 20 plus years of. You know, starting to use light arrows because I didn't even really start using light arrows until I was well, actually God, it's almost 25 years. I bet you I haven't shot an arrow with the exception of one setup I made last year for shooting a deer at 20 yards. It's like this is I'm shooting a deer at 20 yards. Velocity doesn't matter. None of this crap matters. So I did I built the heavier arrow. What's and a heavier my arrow? My penetration was the same. It was like five, which is pretty heavy for me, but Outside of that, I don't think I have used heavier than a 440 grain arrow in 25 years. And I have never really had penetration problems. I've hit it, I hit an elk in the right in the socket once. Um, but outside of that, like I, I haven't seen a penetration problem. I just haven't. I mean, if anything, it's excessive. And I've shot a lot of different kind of broadheads over that time. You know, I've shot. I shot rages, two inch rages for a little while and was passing through shooting out the backside of elk. I'm like, well, and those were, that was a point. I think I was shooting 67 pounds. I was shooting a slower IBO bow than I am now. Um, and I, I was right at 400 grains with those builds, if I remember right. And I just, I had really good luck. Um, but like I said, I, I, I've always gone back to it's the broadhead. It's not the arrow. As long as you're shooting the right spined arrow. Or adequately spined. You can shoot an overspined arrow. It's not really going to hurt anything too much. 
as long as you tune it and sight it in and orientate it correctly. But the um, the physical weight of the arrow does not have hardly anything to do with it. And that one particular test kind of proved that. Now, can we come up with some other tests to help prove that? We can work on that and try to come up with some other options. Um, but I don't think that um, ballistics gel is right at all. Yeah. Because it's not... It's uh, it's creating retention against the outside of it. I don't think that's a, an accurate medium because anything you shoot into animal-wise doesn't react that way. So that's not a good medium either. So somebody, you know, I would love to see about a thousand comments on this video at the bottom telling me what material would work right. I asked because anything I asked. <laughs> anything I can use, like, do I make Jello? Mm -hmm. Like, would we need to make a just a shit ton of Jello? Um, Anything I can use to duplicate it, because uh, mind you, I want to get to the point where I can test every broadhead on the market in a similar fashion and put them through the same materials that would be considered adequate. Now, one, even if ballistics gel was right, it would not be financially possible to do it. Unless somebody wants to sponsor my <laughs> channel for lifetime supply of ballistics gel, because that crap is expensive. Yeah. Because you can't, like, you can only shoot it into it like three or four times. That's kind of where my head's at, too, is like, we need but, something cheap that is that duplicatable. What, yeah, that what can we duplicate? What works? Which that wasn't even cheap. I mean, we used a fresh jug on <laughs> every one. So I mean, we spent you probably spent 50, 60 bucks in water mm -hmm. just to do that test. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know, yeah, we're on the internet, and that seems like, you know, like fame to some people. <laughs> but I guarantee you, you spent more on that test, and we probably got an ad revenue that month. <laughs> like it's not we we don't make a lot of money doing this. So to try to be fair. Here we're we're not. Um, I mean, granted, I do manufacture some things, but we're not like a manufacturer that has like a massive budget uh, for those things. We need to find some kind of a medium that's cost effective to test. And I'm more than willing, you know, message me on Instagram at Podium Archer, comment down below in the videos or something. Give me a better idea. Which, mind you, that was Tim's idea. So, and I I thought it was very interesting, and I. Also expected a little bit more difference than we got, but I didn't expect it to be much because mm -hmm. everything that I have tested and everything that I believe is more towards what a kinetic energy equation is going to tell you, everything else being equal. If you test the same type of field point or the same type of broadhead or the same type of fletchings but different physical weight projectiles, the kinetic energy equation is going to show you typically the difference between those things. If you put a squatty broadhead on the front of one and a three to one cut ratio on the front of the other, you're going to run into a big difference. And what might be a fun test. Oh man, this just popped in my head. I'm super excited. How about we shoot like a, a, a terrible penetrating broadhead on an 800 grain arrow and a really good penetrating broadhead on a 400 grain arrow and see which one does better. And then we can maybe put all this bullshit to rest because the reality of it, it is the broadhead. So if I can build a 400 grain arrow with a super good penetrating broadhead and shoot it against an 800 grain arrow with a broadhead that does not penetrate well and the 400 grain arrow outperforms in penetration, shouldn't that be the end of this discussion? It's shouldn't all be you down little, range, though. Shouldn't, oh, fine, I'll do it at 40 yards because yeah. an 800 grain guy ain't shooting past 40 yards or he shouldn't be. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, I can outrun that arrow past that point, for God's <laughs> sakes, and I'm not very fast. <laughs> But the, yeah. the reality of it is, is that should be truthful. Like, is it the broadhead or is it the arrow? And don't make that video. I want to make that video. Yeah. <laughs> I had a light bulb go off the other day when we were talking with our guy, Drew. Uh -huh. And he was like, said something about the broadhead. And it kind of hit me. It was like, oh, when you're shooting those heavier setups, you're always shooting those more of like more badass broadheads. Yeah, every more, person that's more, shooting, yeah. More three to one. Everyone shooting the heavy yeah. arrows is shooting a good penetrating broadhead. And that's yeah. the freaking point. And even the, the um, what's the word? I don't want to no, close the handle all the way, though. That. Oh, it's not close. It's, no, there you go. Um, the, uh, well, let's just call him by his name, the Ranch Ferry. He's never recommending a broadhead that isn't like that. Ever. They're well, why all. Would he? Long, long, they're all penetrating broadheads. Right. Right. So he's not just emphasizing a heavy arrow. He's super emphasizing the broadhead on it. Right. So he knows it too. Well, the best position to be in is a position of um, not having interest. Yeah. You know? Yeah. At some point, 
when when you get married, you're interested. It's, it it wouldn't be of benefit to disprove it, right? Right, and you could and yeah. it, the opposite works. I mean, you want to endorse stuff you believe in, but also, I mean, you know, to be in a position of no interest is ideal, right? Well, well and I know he has financial ties to some of those things. I mean, um, he sells a, he sells kits for tuning with yeah. you know heavy points, and he has <laughs> broadheads that are his recommended broadheads. And yeah. I don't know if he has ones that have his name on them or, or not, but yeah. I know he does license with particular aero companies to sell his premise, right? Yeah. So he he is financially attached to it. Well, and that's kind of the beauty of me is I'm not financially attached to anything. You're just financially attached to archery. I'm financially attached to selling you archery stuff. Yeah. Just him. And my goal is and always will be to sell you the most effective thing for what you're trying to do. So you hopefully come back and buy from me again. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point. I don't care. I mean, I, I do dabble and I do make some of my own products because if I don't see a product in the industry that fits my needs or what I think it should be, eventually I'll just make one. Um, with the exception of stabilizers because for a long time they they quit making my favorite stabilizer way back when and so I started making my own and so I've made stabilizers for like 12 years. Um, but I never really took it heavily to market. It was just local. So that's not like nobody makes a stabilizer. A lot of stabilizers out there, but they didn't make one that was light where I wanted it and heavy where I wanted it. So I kind of just went to my buddy that was a machinist and had my own made and sourced some carbon from a manufacturer in Utah and not Easton um, and uh, started making my own like a long time ago. So, But yeah, it's usually like, why don't they do it like that? Or why doesn't this exist? Or why doesn't that mm-hmm. exist? So I just start making it. Are people still buying a lot of presses? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there go, it goes through lulls. And the or, most popular press is what the Easy Green. The easy Green, yeah. Easy Green. Yeah, and they just came out with a new, um, wider finger track for them, and now all the presses that um, come out of there will have that on it already. Um, they sell a kit for changing out old ones, as they should. Uh, well, as they're the wider on, ones. Yeah. They're on our website if you if you need a wider one. Um, but Matthew's new title requires a wider, super wide. Super wide. And Extra I, wide. I would be willing to bet that whenever the new hunting bows come out, they require the same. Some might call them thicker uh, than a snicker. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Well, they went from a two and a half on, on the on the last chance. They're two and a half inches. Now they're three inches. So, and there's just two different kits. There's one for the, the easy green slash pack and go. They take the same base and then everything else is the same past that. So, but yeah, it's, uh, we still probably sell two to four bow presses every day. So, I mean, you put that out over a year, and that's like 1,300 to 1,500 bow presses. There's times a year where we don't sell that many. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, we're probably closer to 1,000 a year, I bet you, because there's like July and June are brutally slow for bow presses. I don't know why. So it's been good to see the trend of people working on their bows. Yeah. You know, and... you got me thinking when you're talking about the tuning kit with the different weight mm-hmm. arrowheads. Mm-hmm. Like, I, okay, my archery circle is basically here, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not hanging out other places. I don't mm-hmm. know what they do, but I've never seen a setup that was untunable. You know, <laughs> like, where does the idea <sighs> so of tuning with the idea of tuning with the field points? Yes. Changing is the weight you're of the not spine. adjusting the bow at all. Yeah. So you're tuning that compound like it's a recurve or a long So bow. you would set it at what, center shot, and then start freaking tying on different heads? I, I don't even know if he, if he recommends adjusting anything on your bow, period. Like yeah. even setting a center shot. Just it doesn't matter. If you just get that arrow to bend around that bow just right, it shoots better. And he's not wrong. It does. But you wouldn't need the same level of thing if it was tuned correctly, as far as the orientation of where the rest is, where the wheels are, where the cams are, where the strings and cables are, you would tune easier, so you wouldn't need as stiff of an arrow to make it work, and you would tune with a greater variety, like a much larger window of things would tune through that bow. Like, I could build a bow, uh, let's just say a Bowtech uh, SS34. Set all the wheels right, set everything right, shoot a 300 spine arrow with 150 grains in the front, and probably go all the way up to 200 and down to 100 and not move a thing. And it would still shoot straight. 
and still shoot a clean hole through paper, probably shoot a shaft clean at the same time, even varying in that much. Because a well-tuned bow that's orientated correctly with the rest in the right spot and everything is square will accept a lot more arrow options. So I guess if you want to make it harder to get the perfect or arrow orientation out of your bow, you wouldn't do those things. But isn't some of that, aren't you losing some energy transfer? I agree. I think you are. Yeah. 100%. Like because if, you're if, you, not, if you want to transfer energy the most efficiently, you want everything coming out as square as possible so that mm -hmm. arrow is not correcting itself. And it's going to wobble some, but like the less it wobbles with less weight, the more energy is transferred into the object. Correct. Yeah. Correct. As long as you have adequate spine. Yeah. If you don't have adequate spine, you can only transfer so much energy into an object. Yeah. Which is where the equations of energy make a bigger factor. Um, and that's why I've always gravitated more towards a lighter arrow because I'm still paying attention to the spine. I'm usually gravitating towards one of the lightest GPI arrows I can find, if not the lightest one, and then putting a little more weight well, in the front. And to be honest, you're the first person I n I've known of that is consistently not afraid of tuning a faster bow with a fixed head. A lot of people, that really worries a lot of people. And now I understand why is because it gets more finicky. You have to be more precise. Less things can be wrong. And it's when you're shooting a really fast broadhead out of a a really fast broadhead out of a fast setup, mm -hmm. it's harder to tune. Sure. So of course it is. It's testing your tuning ability. Yeah. And once again, it does boil down to how straight everything is on the bow, where your orientation points are, if everything's squared correctly, if you know how to tune a bow correctly. There's a lot of different ways to tune a bow, but in my opinion, there's only one right way to tune a bow. Mm -hmm. and that's moving the cams left to right, or if you have yokes, wheel leaning the cams to where when you draw the bow back, they're straight. If you do that and you orientate three, 13 16 off the riser in almost every bow, not every bow, but almost every one, you'll get a hole through paper. If it's timed, the wheels are straight, and it's 13 16 off the riser. 13 16 off the riser, and then how about vertical height? Flat. Yeah. Flat, like the bottom of your arrow is straight 90 degrees with the arrow rest where it would touch it draw. But that it, that could be, you know, a half an inch vertically above the riser, or it it could be an inch and a half in theory, right? Mm -hmm. You lost me. What do you mean? I mean, your arrow could be flat and be different lengths if you had vertically like, above the riser, right? If you had really weird uh, knock travel. Yeah. Yeah, but you're going to have a hard time getting optimum performance out of something that has weird knock travel too. So if you've uh, if you've got your knock height high at rest because it drops down when you draw it back or vice versa, you're going to have more of a struggle. doesn't mean mm -hmm. you can't do it, and that's where monkeying with the spine really helps because you can compensate some things and make it bend a little better effectively for that. But in my world, why would you shoot something like that? Right. Yeah. Like, and I understand you can, and I understand this is what I got. I don't have a choice, you know. And what we're really talking about here is like hybrids and single cams are uh, notorious for not having perfectly flat knock travel, i.e. you start here at the bolt hole and you draw it back and it goes up or it goes down and mm. then it comes back up or down on the other end to try to make it travel because you have an uneven amount of string and cable going over the top and the bottom. So it, it doesn't want to travel perfectly. It's it's tricky. Um, Matthew's kind of pioneered the straight line single cam back in uh, MQ1, MQ32 days, and it was as close to level knock travel as you'd ever seen with a single cam bow. Almost every one jogged up or jogged down, depending on how it did. If you put it in a, in a draw board with a, a chart behind it and drew the line, you would see it like deviate up and then dip back down or deviate and then dip back down and come up. It was just some weird stuff, depending on where you hit the back wall and how hard you hit it. And then mind you, this is like 90s stuff, okay? So you step into like 2010, uh, 2011, and you find very little stuff like that. The knock travels are relatively good and consistent and straight. Anything forward from there. Hybrids were like uh, cam and a halfs is a hybrid type of system. The uh, the Hoyt system that they ran for a long time. They weren't perfect, but they were close. They jog a little bit because once again, you had a bigger cable track on the top and a smaller cable track on the bottom. So they didn't run perfectly flat. It like came up and came down or came down and came up depending on which system they ever made. 
And you could get it to tune, but when you looked at your square, it's like certain ones, depending on what module position you had it set in, what it was rotated to, what draw length it was set at, it might not be flat. Because at draw, it had to be here, so when you fired it, it left the bow straight and looked relatively straight through paper. Anything with a binary or a dual cam, equal but opposite eccentric. Okay, so the cam that's on top and the cam that's on bottom are mirror images of each other. Yep. You should have straight knock travel. If they are, because you have the same amount of cable going over the top, same amount of cable going over the bottom, it should draw a straight line no matter what. And it's the most accurate and consistent thing. So if you're using a, a tuning system like that and a, a cam system like that, there's really no excuse for not having it 13 16 off the riser, perfectly flat knock height. When it's timed, it should relatively go perfectly straight. You run into an instance or two where it doesn't, but it's no offense to whatever manufacturer that is, it's probably not made very well. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else you want me to tell you. Yeah. Now, in a perfect world, when you have tears that are left or right, mm -hmm. that's typically fixed with uh, changing the wheeling left to right. If your bow possesses the ability to do that, yeah. and you have relatively the right spine arrow, like you're not trying to make a, a really yeah, under spine arrow. Yeah, assuming a decent arrow, yeah. yeah assuming, you're, assuming you're using relatively a right spine arrow, you should be able to just simply move the wheels left or move the wheels right. Um, now, depending on now, the, the cam system you have and its tunability, that's what I was going to say. You may only be able to move one wheel at a time because the movement is so great. Yeah. That you'll go from a point right tear to a point left tear, moving yeah. at one position. Certain cam systems are less forgiving that way. Hoyt and Matthews. Uh, no, like watch my uh, wheeling videos yeah. on how to how to wheeling adjust this bow, how to wheeling adjust that bow. And you'll see how much it moves per set. Um, Hoyt was twice as much as Matthews, mm. but Matthews still moved a lot. However, I was able to set that particular bow and get the cams to point perfectly at each other at full draw. It was a different set of shims in, in the Hoyt, but you could get them to point at each other, like exactly like this one pointed right at that one, that one pointed right at that one, within a, a 16th to an 8th, you know, it was in the cam groove. And that's good enough, in my opinion, of getting it straight. Yeah. I could not do that with the Hoyt. Now, that doesn't mean they're all going to do that. Um, but that specific one, which it was a 33, so you have a, or a 34. So you have a little bit longer, so it, should, it, it shouldn't move as much because those points are farther apart. There's less pressure on the cable guard. And as you amplify those points apart, you should be able to fine-tune it a little bit more. You get them closer together, and one movement's going to move it farther because it's more pressure. But in those situations when that's happening mm -hmm. and you can't completely fix your left or right the next thing you go to is your arrow rest arrow rest yeah okay. you, you move your arrow rest at that point and you would and what's an unacceptable amount to be moving the arrow rest like you can move it a little bit but what's I, too I, far i typically don't like moving it more than a 16th personally yeah um that's the question i wanted can, to get you can, to. you can move it an eighth that's pushing it though because you get more outside of that and your sight adjustment's going to start getting really weird like your sight picture is not going to look right so let's let's say you got to move your arrow rest to the right, uh, an eighth of an inch to get it to tune, or an eighth of a yeah. Eighth I of, get what you're saying. Eighth of an inch, move it to get yep. it to tune. All of a sudden, you can't see half of your scope because mm -hmm. the pin's so far to the right when you draw it back. If you got to go an eighth to the left, you might run out of left right adjustment on your scope head trying to sight it in because you've moved your sight so far to the left to compensate for the fact that that arrow's not leaving down the center of the bow. At the end of the day, you should be able to get to lean to come down the center of the bow. Um, most manufacturers have a decent amount of adjustment, just some are a little more finicky than others. And I would much rather only move one cam if it came down to that than move the rest more than a 16th. Like I just like to keep them there. Everything lines up right. Everything seems to tune good. Everything seems to broadhead tune really good. Especially when you, if you start moving your rest that far over, you're going to go shoot broadheads and you're going to have a harder time getting the broadhead mm -hmm. and the field point to hit in the same spot. There's just so many things that escalate from that initial setting point. And personally, if we have if we have a bow that won't tune within like a a sixteenth, we're tearing the bow apart. Something's wrong with it. From modern stuff. All right, you get a you get a ten or fifteen year old bow, not the same discussion here. But if you've got like something relatively current and we cannot get it to tune there, the bow's getting torn apart. And then if we can't figure it out, it's going back. Cause that is going to give you problems in the long run. It will, and we can't we can't justifiably charge what bows cost today and allow something to leave like that. Yeah. 
We just won't. It's not right. It'd be like a, a lemon in a car. We're not going to sell it. It's going back to the manufacturer. Yeah. So, How much accuracy is a person losing shooting a whisker biscuit? If they have perfect form, little to none. So the accuracy loss in a whisker biscuit, yeah. in my opinion... Is it with turkey comes, stuff? Huh? With torquey stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you have hand torque issues, it's going to be a lot worse with a whisker biscuit. Your group's going to open up. But the the number one loss of using a whisker biscuit over a fall away or, uh, or limb-driven rest or any of those things is not being able to shoot helical fletchings. Because you can't put a twisted fletch through a whisker biscuit. It'll rip the veins off after like five or ten shots. They'll just wear down and they'll start getting holes in them and <laughs> off they come. Right, you have to keep your veins relatively straight. And the negative side effect to relatively straight veins is if you touch anything, if you nick anything, if you torque your hand a little bit and the arrow wobbles a little more than normal, it takes longer to recover. The longer it takes to recover, the farther it's deviated from the path in which it's supposed to travel, thus the more you miss by, which is why I like a lot of helical. And I get beat up all the time online about that. Or, oh, well, you got parachuting and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm shooting 200 yards. What's the problem? Yeah, your arrow's just parachuting out 200 yards. Yeah, and somehow, <laughs> and somehow it manages to shoot, like, really accurately. I, I, yeah. want, I, I get what they're saying because it looks like it's moving and deviating. And sometimes that's a, a side effect of shooting a slightly too light a spine arrow. You'll see the back mm -hmm. end wobble a little bit more. You can still usually get it to stabilize and shoot well. And with a field point, it won't make a hill of beans worth of difference. Um, and when I've seen those comments, it's usually on my target stuff because most anything of mine that gets filmed is target stuff. Yeah. And I'm not that concerned about that. Well, the one thing I've done is probably shot as much slow-mo arrow on the internet as anyone. Mm -hmm. I don't see anyone doing more of it. If there is, leave a comment, send me an email or a direct message. I would love to know who else is shooting more slow-mo than me in recent years. And I've watched a lot of arrows fly. And there's some interesting observations. Um, one, I've never observed parachuting on the veins we shoot. That mm. doesn't mean an arrow won't parachute. Actually, I, I'm going to take this back a little bit. I've seen some, a little bit of more funk on like a Dan arrow when mm -hmm. he's shooting a shorter arrow with a taller vein. Yeah. I've seen a little more of that. Now, mm. I'm not necessarily going to call it parachute, parachuting, but I think it takes a little longer to correct itself. So yeah. whatever you would want to call that, effect um but i've watched a lot of your arrows fly a lot of my arrows fly a lot of dan's arrows fly a lot of jake's arrows fly and on perfectly tuned bows you'll see some funk and that funk is coming from a few different places it's coming from hand torque yeah imperfect shots yeah more commonly it's coming from a side wind so when a side wind yeah. hits that arrow coming out of the bow it's gonna kick a little bit yeah it's gonna try to pull it yeah and, and then it's gonna more. it's gonna correct itself down range and what they're not getting is that if that arrow's going 130 yards it might be blowing at 20 yards doesn't mean it's blowing it at 120 yards exactly and you're gonna see it pull and then it's gonna correct itself and wobble its way back or it's like it's perfect calm where you're standing but down there by the target it's windy so it gets out there at like 80 90 and all of a sudden you exactly. see it start moving yeah you see that um, little wind tunnels thermals yeah. so when when the wind hits it from the side it does create a little more kick, yeah. but the physical, like, hey, you're shooting a lot of helical, that arrow's going to parachute, mm -hmm. just because of the amount of drag on the back of the arrow, I haven't seen it yet. Well, and my argument for it is usually based off of the decision I would make for someone who's a moderately decent shooter, but not a phenomenally great shooter. A helical fletched arrow will fix your fuck-ups. Yeah, it's more, more forgiving. Than more than any drag loss you're going to have on it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, if you actually test twist versus non-twist, like greater amounts of twist and lesser amounts of twist, you won't really see a drop difference. Now you throw another vein on there, you'll see a drop difference for sure. And it's not just drag, it's weight. It's physical weight. You're adding physical weight to the arrow. It's going to hit lower. Now, just from, from my observation, some things that I would tend to discourage someone from doing is putting a really tall vein on the arrow. I think tall veins are unnecessary to get your broadhead stabilized. Define tall. Um, like what's that AAE one that's kind of stubby and tall? Max Hunter. Max Hunter. How the, far is that? That's what's the tallest one made. It's five eighths. 
Yeah. So that's that was the, uh, tall and short. Yeah, that's the same one Iron Will uses, but he for himself, but it's in the hybrid material. Maybe if it was long and tall, I would see a difference. But when it's tall and short, I definitely see that arrow get affected m the most commonly. And um, if you're seeing that in wind, it's because the higher the surface of the vein is off of the shaft, the more it drags in the wind. Yes. Because wind is a side or a lateral movement, not down the pipe. Yeah. So, but those broadheads do shoot broad, or those, sorry, those, those veins shoot broadheads really well. They're noisy. They make a heck of a noise going down range, but they do stabilize a broadhead really well. So you got to give them that. I used that vein, the first generation of that vein for like four years or five years. It was like all, you couldn't pry it out of my hand because it was very accurate. Yeah. Um, but I never noticed how loud they were. And mm. then I started having, uh, well, Swoop pointed out to me, he had somebody shoot past him down range. She's like, I swear these things are loud and you can hear it. From where you're standing. And like it's putting off an echo of noise yeah. around it. And my observation has been tall tall veins on short arrows also is makes it worse. Um, it's probably a ratio requirement. I haven't seen a lot of, like, for example, a lot of you shooting a taller vein. Uh, so I, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, I usually push it, um, but I also feel pretty comfortable with my ability to make sure it's yeah. tuned right. And if I have, if I don't have enough vein on there, I'll see it. A uh, good example, my antelope bow. I started with a different vein. And you could see it, and it, I think one or two people pointed when out. I say see it, what do you describe? See the arrow wobbling. Oh, okay. Right, that it won't stabilize. Like it's trying to spin and it just can't recover. And what, what was right. your vein profile? It was... That was a 2-3 hybrid. I was trying a 2-3 so low... hybrid with a mechanical. Well, it's low profile, low but profile. not... But not stupid low profile, right. and it's still some decent. And line. it's pretty soft. Yeah, but you could see the back end of it, like whoa, whoa, whoa. Mind you, I'm shooting it on the weak side of spine at stupid fast. Yeah, like 360, right, mm -hmm. or something like that. It was really fast. But as soon as I put the saber minis on it, it went away. Mm -hmm. Like in the same arrow, stiffer vein. It's a stiffer vein, and I, I really believe in stiffer veins, like a I do, lot. I do too, from more that I've observed. Stiff is stiff really helps a lot as long as you can get the vein to stick, mm -hmm. and they're not um, frail, right? So you can nick it with another arrow, and you're not going to have to refletch it immediately. Mm. That kind of stuff, yeah. Because there's some there's some validity to that. If you if you're if your vein's not going to do you any good if you've got to refletch it every fourth time you shoot. Because it's hard to get a refletched arrow as consistent as a freshly fletched arrow, brand new. Because getting mm. the getting the surface completely smooth again is really kind of hard to do. It's always somewhere in between. There's still a little bit of vein or glue residue on there, or I got it all the way off, but I took some carbon with it. Mm -hmm. So now, once again, it's not perfectly smooth. And if you try to put a vein on an imperfectly smooth surface, it, it's got a little whip to it. It's like it wobbles a little bit. So you'll put on three veins, and one of them will look a little funny. Well, there's something under the base of the vein that's causing it to be, look weird. And I like to think that won't be as accurate. Now, it's still probably going to shoot fine. The average guy won't really notice a difference. But if we're talking about perfection here, you're missing a step there if you're refletching your arrow constantly. You're going to end up with imperfectly fletched arrows. Mm. It's just really hard. Interesting. Yeah. I can't remember where I was going with the vein thing. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't yeah. tell me. You, you don't ever tell me. No, I know, but um, just interesting observations from veins through the years. Um, yeah, I, th I think people are most people are probably shooting a little too much vein. Yeah, they, too much they, vein. Oh, the other thing I, I was going to say was astounding how much. Oh, okay, veins do two things that are astounding. If they're fat and you're adding a lot of surface area, it accepts a lot more wind drag. Yeah. And the other thing that I'm learning as I as I've seen more is the greatest source of drag on a pass through is your freaking veins, dude. It is 100%. The higher profile your vein is or the more abruptly straight up it goes, the more likely you are to not pass through. Yeah. I've I thought about feathers a lot because they lay down. Yeah. Cuz I have I've saw, I've shot so many animals that it buried right to the flesh and stopped. Yeah. I was like, "Hmm. I think there's something to this." Or Go all the way through, but it catches on the veins on the back and stops. Exactly. I'm like, hmm. But how do you have a stiff vein and have it collapse to go through? Because it's got to fold over at some point, right? 
Yeah. It's going to hit stuff. It's going to hang up on stuff. You're going to get caught underneath it, which is another reason why it's really important to put the slow set on the tips of your veins. Because if you don't, there's like a little gap there and like a hair or something will get caught under it and it'll snag. It rounds it out. You got to round it out. So there's, you run your finger across it and it wants your finger to roll up on it and not catch on it. What's the name of that stuff? Oh, Fletch Type Platinum. Fletch Type Platinum, yeah. But Max Bond Works, which is a Flex Fletch product. Uh, Saunders made a glue called NPV, which is very similar. Almost everybody makes a a gel, soft, slow set style glue. That stuff really holds on your veins like... Yeah, I mean, yeah, my um, I beat the hell out of my veins, and every once in a while I'll have to pull an arrow out by the vein because of it's mm-hmm. in foam or whatever. Mm-hmm. I haven't ripped off a vein in ages, man. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty uh, incredible. Works good. Um, I want to actually when my my fletching jig gets done, I want to try to use platinum. Period. Because I think the way my my jig works, you're getting like a lot of contact of pressure mm-hmm. on the whole base of the vein, and I think it'll push every last little bit of air out underneath it that the pressure will have it dry Mm -hmm. and you can disconnect it and it'll still stay but we'll see i'd like to use platinum all the way around just because it it's very forgiving it's it's going to be a little messier they're going to be a little more glue sticking out from underneath it in general but man it just it sticks really good and it's it's got a little more flex to it the negative with like super glues is they kind of dry hard yeah so they can pop off like you, you you rarely have a, a vein fleshed with super glue that part of it comes off and the other part doesn't. It's like it just pops clean because it's like it's just it's a hard hard combination instead of like a flexible combination. It's like using hard curing glues versus soft curing glues mm-hmm. on your inserts. You're more likely to pop an insert loose if it's hard curing because it doesn't have flex when there's some friction. Got to have a little flex with that friction. Hmm. Yeah. So some considerations for your veins is: Do you need for you know, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you're going to choose four, it's going to take, it's going it's gonna to drag more with the wind. It's going to have, it's going to have, have more, more surface area when it goes to shoot through something. Mm-hmm. If same, same for a tall vein. If you choose a really tall vein, same, same thing, basically. You're adding mm-hmm. more surface area that's going to accept more wind drag. That's also going to make it harder, not impossible. It's just harder to, to shoot through stuff. I agree. Yeah. Those are all negative things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but there's there's so much to veins and whatnot. It's hard to it's hard to find the right solution at the end of the day. You know, shoot what works for you. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And the back end of the arrow is definitely less important than the front end of the arrow. But, you know, they're both important. They are. They are for sure. Um, it'll be really interesting to see taking some actual real measurement stuff going forward on uh, four fletch three fletch and how much weight and drop and change um that that levi tack video still has me like a little irritated yeah so well some of it's like oh you mean the the arrows that have lighter veins on it higher than the ones that have heavier veins on it yeah weird it must be the design of the vein well like you mentioned earlier it's weight (laughs) it's much easier to do a test without a point of interest yeah like it is. That's that's hard. What if you're doing that test and it doesn't it doesn't show your your vein is near the top? I mean, yeah. how hard would that be to publish? So yeah, which is why people like um, like ourselves or whatever. It's it's better that we test something like that because yeah. we don't really have a dog in the fight. Yeah, we have our biases of what we think is right, but we're selling everything. If something outperforms the next thing, I will gladly sell you mm-hmm. that. I have no problem with that. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't make a difference yeah, no, as no. opposed to the people that design and make the broadheads and the yeah. veins making a, ver- a video about broadheads and <laughs> veins and, oh, wow, yours came up on top on the test that you did. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hmm. Yeah. But it is a good vein, too. Uh, it, it is the hardest vein to get to stick to an arrow. Mm-hmm. But that's a byproduct of not having a base on a vein. If you take the base off of the vein, it's really hard to stick. And that was one of the things that I, when when we were designing my fletching jig was how do we get this vein to stick because this is if i can get this to stick you'll get anything to stick because mm-hmm. these it's good, things do it's not a good litmus test stick. or whatever it's a great litmus test it's like yeah. this vein has to fit in this jig and it has to stick period and you have to be able to do it over and over and over again and a five-year-old kid needs to be able to do it yeah and make sure it's easy and 100 percent duplicated not 95 percent duplicated well how about some like 
Honorable mention arrows. I mean, we sh- shoot shoot the heck out of rip TKOs because mm-hmm. they're great for a lot of reasons. They have a really low GPI, which is grains per inch. Mm-hmm. So it allows you a lot of flexibility with the weight of your arrow. And if you want to have your arrow, you just end up with a lot of FOC, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they got a great coating. They're very durable. Uh, the downside is they're expensive. Yep, they are. And, and now we know they're expensive, so... Uh, regular RIPs are also a good option, but who else is like an honorable mention um, for the arrow category? Well, if you're looking for you know cost effective, mm-hmm. right? You're not spending an arm and a leg and whatnot to to get a good set of arrows. The uh, the rip original rip is very hard to beat and does come in three straightness grades. The rampage from Black Evil comes in two. Yeah, rampages. Rampages and they're very. Oh, sim- rampages for durability. Uh they're similar to a rip. Yeah, um, they're not super durable. They're not frail. Uh, they're more durable than like Rip XB because that's the lightest thing you can get. Uh, another good option, and Gold Tip has always been known for their durability. Traditionally, they mm-hmm. make a black label Quantum. I want to say they're around 150 a dozen. And what's their GPI? Do you know? The eight eight. Oh, three hundred. There's there's that's there's sick. several arrows out there that are yeah like copycats of each other is probably the best way to put it because they all make a very similar weight product at a similar diameter mm-hmm. and similar component options. Um, who else? Uh, G five's coming out with a an arrow that's close to that. Um, uh, Ultra doesn't make a two hundred four. What's a what's a what's the thoughts on Easton Sonics? Uh, Easton Sonic is the right weight in the wrong diameter. Yeah, why did they go six point oh? I don't know. Um, that's a really strange uh, well, move so because I, if you went five point oh, you'd be lighter, right? Uh, no, no, no five. If everything else being equal, a five would actually be heavier. Um, but they they can make a uh a Eight eight to nine one GPI three hundred spine five millimeter. I think what it really boils down to, and this is this is just my gut, and if I'm talking out my ass, I'm talking out my ass. I think they're trying to use six millimeter. One, it's their own size, right? They made it, they created it. Nobody mm-hmm. else had a six millimeter. The um, one of the Black Eagle arrows is in six millimeter. I think it's a Spartan or something like that. Um, but they're the only other one that I've even seen make a six millimeter arrow. So the componentry ops options are very, very minimal. Next There's, to nothing, yeah. You're so well, yeah, limited. it's basically whatever Easton makes you or whatever Black Eagle offers, and that's pretty much it in that diameter. Um, I don't know if they just have machinery that takes that size, so they decided to make the right GPI arrow in that size so they could use their machinery, or what the, what the reason was behind it. And I've had, I've had uh, at least half a dozen conversations about this with higher ups over there wire like every major aero company is making this weight product but you mm-hmm. in this size and i would love to be able to recommend your product because mm-hmm. to get a 300 spine axis it's like 10 something and it's manufactured in the u.s it's manufactured in the u.s and their uh their process is different than everybody else's theirs is, it's an extruded arrow so it comes off the same mandrel like Every axis arrow comes off the same extrusions, one arrow at a time, chopped into 32-inch lengths as it comes out of the machine, right? So you have the least amount of, of variance, or should be, right? So it's, it's a like, good, good manufacturing process, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the from how they explain it, although if you test the products, you may come up with a different variant, but they're not grinding their arrow. Like, it's the arrow, whereas most... Arrow manufacturers are grinding their arrow down to the right spine or the right consistency or the right, you know, weight to make their 300 spine arrow. Like it, it's like a sanding process. Whereas Easton's all one arrow out. So that's pretty exciting. But I also look at that and go, okay, is that why six millimeters is on it? Because you have this whole thing that runs six millimeter, maybe. Maybe that's why they used the right GPI arrow that most people would want, but used it in a, in a six millimeter. That being said, that's a very good arrow. And it's very, very well priced. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's I think, 120 a dozen for regular ones and like 150 for match grade. Yeah, I mean, what right? a great it, product to recommend ha- had it been 5mm and, and just gave people some more componentry yeah, options. Yeah, and I mean, I've, like I said, I, I've gone round and round about it. And yeah. I, I will be really surprised. Now, I could be wrong. But I'll be really surprised if they don't make a lighter five millimeter arrow this coming year. Yeah, I'll, I'll be surprised if they don't because it's I'm not the only person who said it. Yeah, 
like, and I, I mean, I, I'm probably the person who's beat them up the most yeah. about it, but I know other shops are complaining about it too. It's There's like, just a gap in their product line. It, it is, yeah. but you know, it, from their standpoint, right? They're yeah, selling they're more arrows be? every year. So it's like, is it really? Like, well, and I, I remember having this discussion, I won't say who it was with, but it was someone high up at Easton. And I was like, he's like, dude, the Axis is our best selling arrow. I'm like, oh yeah? What's your number two? Oh, it's the Sonic. Like, why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's the right weight. Do you think the Axis would still be your number one selling arrow if that Sonic was five millimeter? Yeah. You're, the industry is literally telling you that this weight is massively wanted because you're putting it in something that nobody else makes and nobody else has sizing for, and they're still, still buying it. They're buying it in spite of. They're the buying oddness. it in spite, yeah. and they may have done that. They may have done that on purpose because they needed to make that diameter for one reason or another. Well, I don't, maybe it's machinery. It I don't know. Matter, I didn't right? ask, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but you know, it, it feels like that that would be the purpose yeah. of it. Of well, we'll make the right weight arrow, and they just have to use that. Yeah, and it it works. I mean, it's their number two selling arrow in their line. But for example, an Axis GPI is at what a three hundred spine. It's over ten. Like I think it's. Let me look it up. Let look me, it up. It might be. A, it might be closer to eleven. I, I, I thought it was I eleven sell, or twelve. I sell so few of them now because they're so heavy. I mean, I have overstock, like a lot of overstock in Axis. Because and meanwhile, everything that's Around the nine grain per inch on a three hundred, is just flowing through the shop like crazy. Rampages, airstrikes, uh, black label quantums, rip TKOs, regular rips. All of those are all three hundred is ten point seven. Ten point seven, and um, like black eagles and RIPs are like eight eight. So it's almost two grains in each. I was gonna say twenty percent. That's over fifty grains. That's twenty percent. That's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. folks. That's. 50 grains. And if you want to, if you want FOC, if you want the weight, yeah. you can throw it in the broadhead. Yeah. Right. And, but if you or want, the component tree. Yeah. but if you want FOC on that arrow, you need like 200 plus grains in the front mm -hmm. to make the same percentage of FOC. So now that arrow's a hundred grains heavier mm -hmm. just to make the same thing. Oh, and by the way, putting another 50 grains in the front of your arrow means you now need a 250, not a 300 <laughs> to achieve the same thing. And the 250 or 260 yeah. is what? And let's just go up to the 250 or 260. Let's see. 11.5. So another grain. Another grain. <laughs> so now you need another 25 <laughs> grains in the front. Yeah. So now you've added... A lot. 150 grains. Yeah. Right? If I did that math right. So now it's a 600 grain projectile. To get the same FOC. To get the same FOC at the same spine. Because you can't just... Put more weight in the front of the arrow without getting a stiffer arrow. Mm -hmm. You can with a small amount, but, and I still can't get anybody to give me a number. It's somewhere between 25 and 50 grains. You need to go to the next spine category, mm -hmm. but I can't get a physical number out of anybody. I don't know why. Yeah. You would think that would be something they would know. Now, another honorable mention arrow, kind of one of the famous ones through the years, is the Easton uh, FMJ. Yeah. Yeah. Which they sell a ton of. Still. Yeah. And how heavy are them? Yeah. Let's look it up. <laughs> They're heavy. These now, things are... so they 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 told me early in the year that it was still it was it was one of their best selling arrows, and they sell a ton of them. And then like two months later, they started a twenty dollar rebate that lasted half the year. Mm. So I don't do you do you put a rebate on something that's selling well? I don't know. I don't know. But Easton does like to still make products that have aluminum in them because they were an aluminum arrow manufacturer to begin with. And they're probably still trying to use equipment and machinery that they have that works for that. That being said, the the FMJ is slicker than snot. There's nothing sticks to it, and very very consistent. Okay, so I, I will I will argue that an aluminum carbon arrow is the straightest thing you're going to put your I've hands heard that on multiple times. They're yeah. very 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 straight and consistent. So 300 spine, you go to 12, 20 <laughs> percent more. Yeah. So that's. Three grains an inch, right? Yeah, instead of two yep. on GPI. To, at 300 spine. Now, if you want more FOC, if you care about that, if you care about maintaining like a higher level of FOC, you're going to have 250 grains? 
to 275 grains, more yeah. in arrow weight. Now they're also making a four mil FMJ. Yeah, they make a four mil FMJ, and the the four mil long range. So go to the the axis long range. So arrow weight wise, that arrow is really close too. But now you're using a a one six six. It's a little heavier, but not a lot. But you're using a one six six now. So your componentry options once again get reduced. Mm -hmm. There are some good ones. Uh, Easton does make their own titanium insert. Gold Tip makes a titanium insert. I make a titanium insert. And if you're going to use a four millimeter arrow, I personally think it's mandatory to use titanium. Um, steel still works fine in 204s, but steel doesn't really work great in 166 because its mass is so stretched out. The material's just got to be harder. Mm. If it hits something hard, it has a tendency to still want to bend. Um, I originally thought like steel was relatively indestructible in an insert. And then I went to a hunt in Texas like 10 years ago with a guy that had a bunch of VAPs that had steel inserts on the front of them. And I get there and he's been there for like five days and there's five arrows <laughs> sitting on the side of the house with the inserts all fucking bent and stuff mm -hmm. from missing and hitting a rock or something. And I'm like, God, I thought you couldn't bend those. Holy crap. And that, that was part of my mental, okay, well, what can you make that won't bend? Mm-hmm. Or is really hard to bend. Yeah. And steel's titanium will bend, but it will, it's, but it's much hard. more hard. It's much harder than steel. Yeah. So it's harder to bend. And the plus with titanium is is that it doesn't have to be so much weight to get some mass, right? So it's it's still relatively light. It's not stupid light, but it's still on the light side of things as far as metals are concerned. So you get strength without having to add stupid amounts of weight, like almost double to achieve the same size. Yeah. And you want your insert to go down inside the arrow a reasonable amount because it helps make it straight. It helps keep it square coming out of the arrow. Shorter your insert internally in your arrow, the more likely you are to get wobble. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It matters. Yeah. I like that more people are using uh, titanium as a component. It's a... Uh, it's a good, it's good, you know, and it seems like more manufacturers are able to work with it, which I always heard was the, the, the downside in the past was like, it was hard to work with or whatever. Oh, it's hard to work with, but, yeah. and that, which is why a lot of them just didn't do it because mm -hmm. they didn't want to have to deal with the, uh, the tooling and the costs. And they didn't think people would spend that. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the biggest hesitation for a long time is they just didn't believe people would spend that much money on an insert. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe people would spend that much money on the insert, but I wanted it, so I was willing to spend that much for myself. And the difference between making a hundred and a thousand was not that much. So I went, screw it, I'll make a thousand. And if people buy them, people buy them. If they don't, I'm good for a really long got, time. I got a good ass personal <laughs> stock. I, I just got a lifetime <laughs> supply of my own insert. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and we're we're working on revising those things too. There's always. There's always ways to improve and working on a different 166 system, trying to find something that's a little more universal and maybe a little more durable than what exists currently. Um, but, you know, that's all back pocket. Do you have a timeline on your uh, fletching jig? Rev 9 is being made right now. Ooh, a Rev 9. Yeah, we're up Dang. to the ninth version of it. Um, we're wait we're going to we got 2 weeks waiting on some parts that we had to order for indexing to make sure they work right. Um Rev 8, I was very happy with. Um, it pretty much does everything I want to do other than there was one little deviation in it, and I, I'm 98%. I know why, and that was what the part was. But while we're waiting for the part, me and the machinist and then the guy who owns the company that um, is the head uh, designer um, sat down talked about it and went, you know, this is still kind of, hard to load and it still takes a little bit to get it loaded so they wanted to revise it a little bit from what we talked about and i agreed to it so hopefully it works out and hopefully this doesn't actually set us back in time um but if it works like they're thinking the next rev's gonna i think that's probably gonna do it and we should hopefully have a finished product here in another couple another month to month and a half what's well, exciting there's a lot of opportunity for freaking fletching jigs dude like there's opportunity for a lot of innovation, but man, I mean, no one's really done a sweet jig, you know. Uh, you know, Fire Knox was really nice, but it was really expensive. But yeah. it's still a, a singular. There's a few options that are good, there, but also really ones. expensive. Yeah, Vein Master Pros are really a good fletching jig. They, good they work really yeah. well. Uh, a Bits and Burger with the right componentry actually works quite well. It's just slow. Well, it, it's not just that. It's not just slow. It was it was designed for 
you know, 11 30 seconds, 2364 diameter arrows 100 years ago, damn near, right? So the fletching jigs, the clamps, everything are designed for four inch and five inch fletched feathers on a cedar arrow. That's what it's made for. It's not mm -hmm. made for two inch veins or three inch veins on a on a 1764 diameter shaft or a 1564 diameter shaft. So it's, it's it, made for those four inch feathers I slapped on my indoor arrows. Dude. Right. Yeah. And it's made for a big fat arrow. Those and things that's, are nasty, that, that's dude. what, that's what it's for. That's, <laughs> that's what it's for. That's what it's designed yeah. for. And this is designed off the premise of what we use today. It's designed to be somewhat idiot proof. Like you can't screw it up. I'm sure somebody will find a way, but the premise is that, like I want this to be 100% duplicatable, no matter what. So anybody can put a vein on and put a vein on the exact same way next time, and really durable and still relatively easy to use and not ridiculously expensive. My original hope in price point, uh, we're probably going to exceed, because at one point I said I don't care how much it costs, I want it right. I don't want to cut corners. I don't want to injection mold things out of plastic. I want this thing to be a fletching jig that'll last pretty much forever mm -hmm. that will work correctly. And if it's more expensive, then so be it. I'll come at a higher price point. I don't care. Uh, and I definitely want it to be retailable by shops because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to keep making things that I design that I can only really afford to be the person who sells them. I yeah. want shops to be able to sell the products. Yeah. Um, so going forward, I'm really trying to focus on that. I want, you know, the people that I have a lot of shops that listen to me, mm -hmm. actually, which surprised me. I didn't, I didn't think I'd have so many, but a lot of them do. And it, it's hard for me when they go, can I buy your inserts? And I was like, I, I, there's just not enough margin in them. Mm -hmm. I'm working to get that a little better as the price of them go up, and I'm hoping to um, next year have, have shops be able to buy them. And we are working on a, a portal on our website that's almost done. The pricing hasn't been put in yet, but we do have a, a login set up to where we can set up people for distribution which is our goal is to be able to let shops buy products from us. And that will include the products that we make. Um, some of them won't have a great margin because there's not a lot of margin in them. Um, but we're trying to redistribute all the products that we sell on our website to shops if they wish to buy them and resell them. If they're a smaller mom and pop or they don't have the volume or they're just trying to get a couple of pieces in a hurry because um, there's not a distributor in the West. And right now all three of all three major ones are all back East mm. and it's a long ways away. And I, I'm a Western guy. We carry the products in our shop that are really for Western people. So it makes sense to me to distribute to Western shops, which there aren't a ton of them anyway. No. So it won't, it'll never be a big part of our business. I just wanted to, I wanted to give out an option because I'd been asked a lot for it. So um, we're going to go through and work in the back end pricing. So we got to go through every item that's on the website and put in a dealer price for it. Um, but there'll be a login after you get verified as a dealer. Uh, and you can go to our website, punch in your login, and put things in your cart, and it's pretty cool. Buy it just like everybody else. So, uh, hopefully, that'll be done in the next month to two months. We're still data entering all the UPCs and inventory quantities, so everything talks. But um, it's it's kind of slow right now in the shop, so it's a good time to do it. Things are getting really clean and organized, and barcodes are getting entered. And I'm anxious for the day that it's all 100% electronic, and I can take some of that out of my head and stop thinking about it because I think about it a lot. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. I like that. It's a nice way to, I don't know. It should be good for relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, some shops will be competitive and some shops will not like the fact that you sell direct to the consumer. Um, but I like to think that um, if I'm also offering them the opportunity to buy a product, if they need it and help them operate their businesses, maybe that'll bridge the gap a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, I, know, I don't just want every archer to embrace the reality that they need to work on their own stuff. I want the shops to embrace it too because then they won't be as afraid and they'll probably be more open to learning and they may learn more things that get presented to them because somebody did something and figured something out and wanted them to explain it to them. Maybe they didn't know. You know, there, There's a lot to be learned from opening the door to how these things work and how important it is that the actual person understands how it works and is capable of working on it. So, you know, maybe by setting them up to be able to buy products for me, maybe they're paying a little more attention to what I'm putting out there. And maybe it, you know, turns a light on and goes, I need to be more open to this. Because like it or not, we're going this way. And 
you, you can either embrace it and support it or eventually alienate your clientele. Yeah. Because your clientele is not going to like the fact that you don't want them to do this and that you're kind of fighting them on it. Well, more, it'll create a more enthusiastic customer. Right. Um, I've already seen it in golf. You know, there's just so much more information available than there was 10 or 20 years ago. And whatever you want to learn is out there now. But that hasn't stopped people from taking lessons or buying equipment or using their local pros. It just may have shifted the questions that are getting asked. And it's just a much more educated body of people as a whole. I definitely get asked a lot more different questions now than I used to by a long shot. And they're not afraid to ask you. Mm -hmm. So you start opening up about what you know and being willing to share. And they're going to ask you a whole bunch more questions that they wouldn't ask before. And it helps develop a relationship with that. And they appreciate the fact that you're willing to share it to them. So they're more likely to go back to you, Mm -hmm. even if you're more expensive, because they want to support you because they want you to be there so you can help them if you're as open with them as they want you to be. Mm-hmm. So. I'm for it, you know. Food it's good stuff. Out. Fire's out. Appreciate you guys. Subscribe or leave this thing a review wherever you're listening to it. On YouTube, we need to get to 5,000 subscribers. Like that, you know, we should have already been there. Comment down below on what we should have been shooting through other than water jugs. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, leave us a review on the audio platforms. That That'd stuff helps nice. a lot. It really does. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, algorithms pay attention to that kind of stuff. Yeah. So please do it. Yeah, it helps. Thank you. Thanks.